Good afternoon. I'm President and CEO Julie Decker of the FSU Alumni Association, and I am so delighted to welcome you to the 10th Webinar Wednesday series. I can't believe it's the 10th already. Throughout this virtual series, we have brought experts into your home to provide you with practical and relevant information to navigate the current climate in which we find ourselves. I wanna give special thanks to those of you who are members of the Alumni Association joining us today. Your commitment to the university and to this organization is noticed and so appreciated. I'd also like to thank our corporate partners for their generous support, which makes programs like our Webinar Wednesday series possible. Thank you. Today, I have the great pleasure of introducing our presenter and FSU alumna, Jennifer Farrell. Jennifer is a registered dietitian who has been teaching at Florida State for almost 15 years. Jennifer teaches metabolism, life cycle nutrition, nutrition counseling, and general nutrition. She is the director for the undergraduate dietetics program, which prepares students to become dietitians. Prior to her teaching career at Florida State, Jennifer worked for the Department of Health Bureau of Child Nutrition Programs, a treatment facility for eating disorders at a hospital in Tampa. Today, Jennifer will share information on mindful eating, how to honor your body by listening to the needs of your body, and the importance of creating a healthy relationship with food. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us. We're so happy to have you here. Good afternoon, thank you so much. I am very honored to be here, thank you. Um, welcome everybody. Um, as Julie said, I am a dietitian and I love my profession. I love nutrition. And the reason I love nutrition is because you can talk to anybody about food. Food is a universal language. Um, you can talk to them about food because food is our identity. It is our family history. So we all have those family members and those recipes that they bring every Thanksgiving. Think about it. You can picture that family member. You can picture their recipe in that same dish. Food is our religion. I'm sure you can think of more than one um, food that's tied to a religious observance or ceremony or holiday. Food is love. Food is comfort. What do you eat when you're sick? Mm -hmm. It makes you think about it. Food is also money and stress. I mean, food bills are a major part of our budget. Uh, food is happiness. I'll bet you can think about a food that every time you think about it, it makes you smile. Food is control, and for many, it's something to be controlled. And throughout our life, our relationship with food changes. I mean, right now, our relationship with food has changed a lot in a very short period of time. And this is why it's especially important that we practice self-care through intuitive and mindful eating. Somewhere along the way, we have been trained to control our food intake through outside measures. We plug our food into a database that counts our calories and spits out macronutrient percentages. And we wear trackers that tell us how many calories we've expended. And at the end of the day, we give ourselves accolades if our calorie amount is in the right place. And sometimes we check to find out how many chocolate kisses can we have? Or maybe we find out that we can't have any. Or maybe we are hungry, but the diet tracker says, nope, you've already eaten enough. Somewhere along the way, we've given our power of hunger and health away to this inanimate object. But what if we took that power back? What if we treated our hunger like we treat a good friend? We don't log our interactions with our friends. We don't connect with our friends because of some log that we've said. We do it when it feels right. We are supportive and loving to that friend. What if we treated our hunger like we treat our friend? What if we listened to our hunger instead of shoving it down? What if we listened to what our bodies really needed? This is the concept of intuitive and mindful eating, and it gives us the power to trust our bodies. Babies are born with this, and it's so cool. They know when they're hungry, they know when they're full, and even at those earliest days though, babies are being taught to override these signals. It happens more so with bottle-fed than breastfed babies. 
So a breastfed baby goes to mom, nurses, typically falls asleep, and that baby is put to bed. But a baby on a bottle, oftentimes, you know, you're, you're holding that baby and whoever that loved one is with the greatest of ten intentions looks at that bottle and says, nope, just one more ounce, finish that last ounce. And they're often encouraged to eat that last ounce to override that feeling of fullness. Already, that baby is learning that their hunger and their full cues are not correct. Let's look at this throughout life. This lesson continues throughout life. How many of us remember being told at the dinner table, you can't get down until you finish your green beans, or you can't get down until your plate is empty? How many of us still feel the need to eat those last few bites of whatever it is on your plate, even though you're kind of full? So why do we make babies eat the last ounce? Why do we make a child clear their plate? Food is love, and many times we do that out of love but it's misguided. Sometimes we do it in hopes that that baby's gonna sleep through the night, but again, misguided. Um, these efforts so well-intentioned, but the problem is the babies are being taught that their hunger cues are incorrect, that they need an outside source to tell them when to eating. Babies are rapidly growing and their growth patterns dictate their hunger and their sleep patterns. So bottle feeding or having them eat more is not going to change that. The other really cool thing, when a baby nurses on mom, mom's milk composition changes. And when a baby starts eating nonstop and mom's like, oh my gosh, I just fed that baby. There's no way they can be hungry, but they are. This is called cluster feeding. And it's telling mom to change the composition of milk to be really protein rich, but also to make more because a growth spurt is about to happen. But formula doesn't do this. Formula is consistent. So this is why it's really, really important, particularly for those bottle fed babies, that we listen to their cues, hunger and fullness. We let them decide. I mean, I don't have their belly. They know when they're hungry and when they're full. As our kids grow and they begin to eat solids at the table, the table can so often become a battleground. Again, you can get down when you eat your green beans or I'm a mom that shops at Publix. <laughs> if you're good, you can have a cookie. Food becomes a reward. What we're telling kids is that a full tummy means nothing. They are learning that they cannot trust their body to tell them when they are full or when they're hungry. Instead, they need to look to an adult. And kids look to adults for so many other things in life that as we continue, this becomes natural to them. But again, kids are growing. They're going through growth spurts. And one day they're going to eat everything in sight and you will swear they ate their body weight. And the next day they will eat nothing. And again, this is a normal pattern. But as parents, we often try to fix this problem as we see it. And then we offer a favorite food and another favorite food. And this child learns that if they hold out long enough, whether they're hungry or not, they hold out long enough, they're gonna get their very own meal of their very own favorite foods. And so I think it's no surprise that studies have shown that children who have parents who either enforce or restrict foods are more likely to be picky eaters and overweight. Using a food as reward, which I, as I mentioned, I am guilty of this myself, but unfortunately it further encourages the notion that this food is special, and that when you get it, it should be eaten in large quantities. So making food a non-issue, how do we do that? How do we raise competent eaters? The number one thing is you just don't argue with kids about food. It needs to become, like I said, a non-issue. We all know that argument. You can get down when you finish your green beans. And then it turns into, fine, just one last bite of green beans. And then it turns into, fine, just eat a green bean. Just, just take a bite, eat the green bean. Now, where has this argument gone? Is it really about the nutrients from the green beans at that point? It's a battle of wills. And we don't want food to become a battle of wills. So if we don't start that battle, 
we won't engage in that battle. I have a favorite child feeding expert, and her name is Ellen Satter. And I am going to try and share my screen here and show you a little bit about her division of responsibility. Ellen Satter, as I mentioned, is a child feeding expert. Let's go back, sorry. And she has a theory, the division of responsibility. And she says, the caregiver decides what to serve, when to serve it, and where to serve it. So the caregiver is responsible for preparing healthy meals at times when a child needs them, and a child may eat three meals and four snacks. The child may eat multiple, just a few snacks during the day. And where? Meals really should be at a place where they can be enjoyed and eaten mindfully. The child is going to decide how much, if any, to eat. And I know, how much, if any, to eat. If any, that sounds crazy. But that is the way to get children to make this a non-issue. Let me see. I think I have stopped sharing. Is that right? All right. So where do we go from there? There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Got a little bit lost on the technology here. So where do we go from there? So we want our children to eat healthy. So the parent should provide these healthy, responsible foods. And it's up to that caregiver to make these foods healthy. And also to model. And this is why where you eat is so important. If you want your child to drink milk, then drink milk with them. We laugh at the whole notion. We say, do as I say, not as I do. And we laugh at that because that is a the, the absolute worst way to teach a child. So instead, we want to model this with them. The other thing is at the dinner table, you don't encourage children to eat, but you can talk about that food in a way that gets them excited to eat. Wow, these green beans are super green. Isn't that your favorite color? Or did you notice how these green beans are a little bit crunchy? Do you like them a little crunchy? I think that's really cool. And therefore, they're going to start trying that food. It gets them to try that food. They want to give it a shot. So no begging, no bartering, just let them eat. And when they eat, no accolades. The other thing is, and we talk about picky eaters, we want to be smart about the foods we serve them. So serve new foods, but serve them next to foods that are old favorites. So um, if they love chicken nuggets, serve a new vegetable next to chicken nuggets. And it's a great thing to get them involved in the meal. So you can have them count out the chicken nuggets that are gonna go onto the, into the oven. And that way, if they want chicken nuggets and they're not going to touch the vegetable, that's okay. But if you've counted out your chicken nuggets, you also know there's not an unlimited number of chicken nuggets for them to eat. So they'll eat their chicken nuggets and you say, well, you know, there's no more chicken nuggets, but there are more of this cool vegetable that you helped me prepare. Getting kids involved in the meal process is a great way to up and open up those avenues and those pathways. There have been some studies that show that kids will need up to 12 exposures of a new food before they'll decide it's not new and they're gonna try it. This is not an overnight story. It's gonna be long and it's going to take time. So just take a few deep breaths, make food a non-issue. Your kids will become competent eaters. And that's a great skill for them to take out into the world. As we move through adulthood, we are continuously bombarded with new diet and fitness and everything else. And so it's really important that we figure out how to take the power away from these external controls and give it back to our body. And the first thing with doing that is to identify our hunger. So how do we know? Are we physically hungry or are we emotionally hungry? 
And I like to use the term emotionally hungry or non-physical hunger. Um, let's see, I'm having trouble advancing my slide. There we go. Um, physical hunger versus emotional hunger. Now, you could call this non-physical hunger as well because sometimes it's hard to identify these emotions. Physical hunger comes on gradually and it's patient. So you know you get hungry and you don't eat for a little while and then somebody says, come on, weren't you really hungry? And you go, yeah, yeah, I guess I was. Emotional hunger comes on suddenly and it is urgent. Physical hunger, if you're really hungry, then that apple's gonna look great to you. But if you are non-physical hunger, there's an emotion associated with this, that is going to be a very specific craving. Physical hunger, you typically stop once you're full. Not always, sometimes you eat mindlessly and you go past full, but typically you stop when you're full. Emotional hunger, you always go past full. You very most likely will go past full because you're eating for the taste, for the flavor, for the comfort. But the thing is the food is not fulfilling that comfort. And so therefore your emotional hunger is most very likely to have you eating more than you would. Physical hunger does not cause guilt. You know that you are fueling your body. Emotional hunger is very typically associated with guilt because you know you are eating something that your body doesn't really need. Emotional hunger is very likely associated with foods that are typically um, high sugar, high salt, high fat, sometimes a specific texture, warm and gooey, salty and crunchy. So when you can identify that, is this physical hunger or is this emotional hunger? You say, well, physically my stomach is not hungry, but I, I am hungry. Think about this. How are you feeling? Take, do a check-in with yourself. Are you feeling stressed? Are you feeling sad? Are you feeling happy? We never associate happiness with emotional hunger, but absolutely we eat when we are happy. So then we ask, what can we do to feed this non-physical hunger? Because food is not gonna fulfill it. It's interesting, kids are much less likely to emotionally eat. Kids have this emotional outburst and they get a big hug and they release the energy and they get the comfort and they're done. But adults, we're not allowed to have emotional outbursts and we very often don't get those big hugs that we need. So we are more likely to emotionally eat than children. So what can you do to get that release, that emotional release? Here's where you pick up the phone, you call a friend, you text a friend, maybe you have an inspirational passage, something that fulfills that emotion. Um, maybe there is meditation, prayer, something along the lines that will fulfill the emotional or emotional feelings and the non-physical hunger. The other thing to question is, maybe I really don't have too many emotions associated, but maybe this is just a habit. Maybe this is just something I'm so used to doing this right now that I'm just used to it. I'll give you an example. Habits form very quickly. My kids are home from school and I'm here at home and I finish teaching a class and I'll walk out into the living room to check on them. And I absolutely walk through the kitchen and I have gotten into the habit of grabbing a snack. And I'm not really hungry at that time of the day, but I'm there. And it's become this sort of punctuation mark at the end of my class. And I've realized that it's time to find a new punctuation mark. Maybe I can, again, text a friend real quick, a quick check-in. Um, maybe I can set up a puzzle. My kids love puzzles. I can do a few pieces and get back to work. Maybe I just find, need to find something different. Um, maybe I can walk to my mailbox and get my mail a different punctuation mark. And so sometimes it's just changing a habit. So once you find that punctuation mark and fulfilling that non-physical hunger, this may allow you towards weight loss, long, slow, steady weight loss. If you emotionally eat and you recognize that you often emotionally eat, 
then this can lead to long, slow, steady weight loss. This is not the fast track. This is a healthy relationship with food for the rest of your life. But what if we've decided that it is physical hunger? Our stomach says, I'm hungry. So there is this really cool thing, and it's a hunger scale. And this hunger scale was, you can Google this image. This is the most common or popular one. And this says number five is here satisfied, neither hungry or full. And then notice here in the green to yellow range, we've got a little bit hungry starting to growl and all the way to slightly full or pleasantly full. So it stands to reason that if we stay within here, then we are no longer getting famished and hangry. And we are also not stuffing ourselves. This number 10 is what I would say like Thanksgiving stuffed, really uncomfortably full. If we can identify our hunger and catch our hunger around here, three or four, then we are much more likely to mindfully and intentionally eat as opposed to sort of having a meal happen to us. If we wait until we are starving, feeling dizzy, we are much likely to grab for the closest foods, which tend to be sugary, salty, fatty, com convenience foods, and eat more than we would normally and find ourselves here. So if we can catch our hunger here, we're more likely to stay within the middle range as opposed to catching our hunger at one or two and then boomeranging, boomeranging all the way up to nine or 10 and then saying, oh no, I've overeaten, I'm not going to eat again, and coming way back down. So this hunger scale is a great way to kind of identify how hungry am I? Because then you can also think, how much am I hungry for? And again, this is great so that those meals don't happen to you. And we've all had a meal happen to us. To me, it happens most likely when I'm going for Mexican food with friends. You sit down, there's the chips and the salsa, and you start to just kind of mindlessly dip and eat. And then by the time your food comes, you're really not hungry, but you feel like you need to eat because you've ordered a meal. And then at the end, somebody orders dessert and you take a bite or two, you find room for it. And at the end, you're pretty full. And really, you've been paying attention to so many other things, but not your hunger. So if we can catch that hunger early enough, we can make that decision. Sit down at that restaurant or think about your food in your kitchen. Say, okay, how much do I need to eat? Am I really hungry or am I just a little bit hungry? But also, if we listen to our body, we're more likely to make decisions that are going to be healthy for our body. Is my body really craving chocolate cake? Or does my body really need, you know, wouldn't some chicken and some salad be great for my body right now? So the more mindful we are about our hunger, the more likely we are to pick foods that are going to fuel our body. Intuitive eating is the concept of eating when you're hungry and stopping when you're full. And that's what we sort of talked about all the way from childhood, infancy to adulthood, is how to keep and hold on to those feelings of intuitive eating, how to listen to your body. Mindful eating says that when we are sitting down to eat, we are going to pay attention to that food and we're going to pay attention to our feelings of fullness. So that chips and salsa, were they really good? I mean, were they, were they good? Were they stale? Were they a little too salty? Was this uh, a little too salty? Was this salsa a little spicy or not? Do we remember that? So mindful eating is really paying attention. Do I want a meal or do I want chips and salsa? Am I going to just have the chips and salsa because that's my favorite part? And that's the part about mindful eating that really gets you to encourage your body to stop eating when you're full because you paid attention to it. So right back to those chocolate kisses. If you listen to your body and you take these chocolate kisses and you unwrap them and they have a very distinct sound, don't they? And you can smell that chocolate. To me, it reminds me of Easter candy. I don't know why. 
but you smell that chocolate, a distinct smell of chocolate. And then when you bite into it, you can taste that chocolate and really think about it. Is it smooth? Does it have little crystals? Is this your favorite chocolate or do you prefer dark chocolate? This is mindful eating. And when you do this, you will realize that maybe you don't need as many Hershey's Kisses, maybe just one or two are going to fulfill that need for you. So in conclusion, um, intuitive eating is finding when you're hungry and stopping when you're full and truly listening to your body. Mindful eating is paying attention to the foods that you're eating so that you truly enjoy them and you're not reaching for more simply because it's in front of you. And as you practice this, just identifying physical hunger versus non-hunger, identifying, am I truly enjoying this food? Am I truly feeling full? You're going to realize that there's no good or bad foods. You're going to realize that hunger is not something to be controlled. And if we listen to our body, our relationship with food is going to be something that we can enjoy and it's going to fuel our body. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was fantastic. And I have to say, I feel seen with the chocolate kisses. I'm exposed. And I don't know if my team knows. No, they didn't. Um, that is a guilty pleasure. And I have this, in this quarantine, I've never had chocolate kisses around, but I have during quarantine. <laughs> so, so funny that you um, spoke on that. So I wanted to ask you, um, when you find find you're talking to people about this and parents about this, do you find for them that it feels like a paradigm shift in their minds of how they are thinking of food? Because I think all of us generationally, whether you're a baby boomer, a Gen Xer, a millennial, we all cleaned our plates and we all didn't leave until um, the, the plates were clean or what have you. So how do you find people react to that? This is tough. We have, especially because there are generations that are still children of those who came through the depression where food was a huge issue. I wonder what's going to happen after now um, this whole incidence because grocery shopping has changed significantly yeah. and food becomes money more so than maybe just fuel for the body. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important Many parents, um, it's really hard when food, there's food insecurity in the family mm -hmm. because then of course, watching food go into the trash is extremely painful. Mm -hmm. But when um, there's less food insecurity, it is a paradigm shift. And one thing we work with is um, just preparing smaller portions right. so that we don't see food go into and also meal planning so that any leftovers can be turned into something else. Right. And, but it is, it's a total paradigm shift completely. Yeah. My great aunts are the queens of taking leftovers and turning them into two and three meals. And you alluded to grocery shopping during this pandemic and during this time. Talk a little bit more about that and what you're seeing there. So grocery trends, grocery shopping trends, a lot of what's come out has been looking at trends from April. So we will see as things start to open up if, if trends shift again, but certainly more online shopping, mm -hmm. fewer trips to the grocery store, um, less variety. People are decreasing their variety that they're buying because they're not spending as much time in the grocery store either. And in terms of money, uh, it's harder to shop the sales and coupon clip right now and which makes it also a little more difficult to really try and plan a meal and pick out those things. Mm -hmm. So it has put a lot of stress in terms of just finding ways to put together meals and trying to keep them within a budget. In terms of what people are buying, it's interesting. You will see one group says we're buying more fruits and vegetables, and then you'll see another group that says we're buying less fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. So are we eating healthier or or less healthy seems to vary widely. And that's probably dependent on which group of people are they still working or not working um, and, and how they're getting their groceries. Very good. Well, another question um, one of our attendees submitted ahead of time was talking about parents who have picky eaters. 
how do you make eating balanced, uh, eating a balanced diet a non-issue? And you talked a little bit about that, talking about you have to put it in front of them 12 times, which for frustrated parents and picky eaters, that seems like um, almost yes. insurmountable. <laughs> but what is your advice there? It doesn't need to be 12 times in a row. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it doesn't. Um, I think that with picky eaters, and it depends on the child, very young children are overwhelmed by too many options. So your preschool children, they want to see just a few options on the plate and typically separated, and that makes them a little more, um, they can see what's there. And in the same way, very young children, like again, preschool and younger, typically don't like foods that are really mixed together. They have a hard time identifying the foods. As they get older, um, maybe two vegetable options, one you know they like, one they don't like, for example, or um, making sure there's at least something on the plate that they like. But then when you make that dish, don't make an overabundance of the one thing they like, because then they will just eat that. But if you can truthfully look at them and say, look, you know, this is everything we have. If you're still hungry, we've got some vegetables here. Mm -hmm. Picky eating is so hard because um, kids are very strong-willed <laughs> and, and we need to move it from a will issue to a true food issue and, yeah. and truly getting them, them eating again. Um, I love that. Um, so last question. Um, with changes due to uh, routines due to COVID, this is a good one. I imagine several are dealing with this. My kids are sleeping late and not eating breakfast. What advice can you share to create more structured eating routines? Um, or is skipping a meal acceptable? All right, now I feel very seen. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, our schedules have changed very much so. We really want children to eat breakfast before school because their tummies don't hold enough nutrients to get them to lunch. But if we are at home and they can have that morning snack and then have a, a healthy lunch, I don't think that skipping breakfast is, is such a negative thing. I mean, our routines, we, we, they have changed. They really and truly have. But they're also not as active as they would be at school. So yeah. I, I think that um, finding the routine that works for you and fits within your nutritional needs uh, or your child's nutritional needs is more important than making sure that you're, you're back on the, the strict breakfast, snack, lunch schedule. So you're saying nutrition before routine, as long as they're getting the right nutrition. Okay. Yes. That's... Because I think at home, the routines are very different. Mm -hmm. So, so different. Yes. right. Okay, well, I do have one more question, arguably the most important question. Can you share with us your favorite FSU memory? Oh my gosh, my favorite FSU memory. Um, wow. I'm trying to decide <laughs> if it would be a professional one or a student one. My favorite student memory would be going to my first football game because the amount of excitement and energy is just electrifying and watching Chief Osceola plant the spear. I think as a student, that is absolutely just one of the great memories. Um, professionally, my teaching my first class was just such a high for me and I've loved it ever since. That's awesome. That's good. We'd love hearing those stories. Well, thank you again, Jennifer, for taking time out of your day uh, to be with us and to share your expertise. We know for sure the university is better because of faculty and staff like you and alumni like you, of course. Um, participants joining us, thank you for being here once again and for connecting with the Alumni Association. We hope you continue to engage with us through these webinars. Please share your ideas with us. Be sure to fill out the survey when you receive it. We will resume our series on July 8th, and that will feature Billy Francis, Director of the Student Veterans Center. We're so excited to have him. I hope you have a wonderful holiday, and as always, go Knowles. Thank you.